Welcome to The Teaching Table, a monthly podcast where we'll engage in insightful conversations about the dynamic world of teaching, learning, and technology within higher education. Brought to you by the University of Buffalo Office of Curriculum Assessment and Teaching Transformation and made possible by the generous support of the Genteels Excellence and Teaching Fund, this podcast aims to shed light on the pathways to educational excellence. I'm your host, Maggie Grady, a learning designer and cat. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Corey Placido, a lecturer for the math department, for a discussion on innovative teaching, student success, and what role the instructor plays in that. Welcome, Corey, and thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for inviting me here to the podcast. It's great to see you again, Maggie. I'm really looking forward to sharing whatever whatever bits of experience I can have that you can glean insight from from my teaching. But wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. Sure. So I appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. Uh, when I first thought about who I wanted to interview and who I wanted as a guest on the Teaching Table podcast, I wanted engaging teachers that had a unique approach to reach their students, and I naturally thought of you. You and I first met back in 2018 in the effective teaching classes offered by our department. How do you feel you have evolved since you have first begun teaching? How have I changed or how has my teaching changed? Oh. I mean, I guess I'd say I'm, I'm nothing if not a teacher, so either is okay. <laughs> but, you know, I'd say I'm a lot more cognizant of my teaching overall and a lot more sensitive to different learning styles of my students. I feel in general that I do a, a better job of reaching more of my students through the lecture and the classroom experience. Mm -hmm. And I definitely think going through those courses is very helpful and, you know, at least opening my eyes to what's available to me as an instructor different paths that I can take to try to reach my students and, you know, giving me the tools necessary to, to further that. Being at UB for so long, and I've been teaching here since 2012, which now would be about half of my life, I, there's been a lot of changes, and I think you don't really notice that evolution in the, the smaller moments of it, mm -hmm. like semester to semester, and maybe it could just be a student asking a, a different question that I've never been asked before, and thinking of, you know, a response for that, trying to get into their mindset and trying to help out. But I think if you were to take a snapshot of me when I, when I first started teaching at UB and compared to a snapshot now, there's a lot of changes in my teaching. I think I've gotten much better at it, uh, better at approaching the material and making it a lot more comfortable for students, right? I always want to try to keep a student-minded approach to my teaching. How do you feel that you have uh, changed to adjust to the students' needs, or how do you adjust to the students' needs? You know, I really try to be a lot more student-centric. I try to be very compassionate to their position mm -hmm. as a learner and make sure that they know that they can always come to me asking questions. After teaching for so many semesters, mm -hmm. I really start to see what the, you know, Maybe, maybe it's better to say what the incorrect approaches are, okay. right? If I do something that doesn't seem to resonate with students, I'll be one of the, the first or second to realize that. I think mm -hmm. maybe students pick up on that first uh, through their own experience, their own unique lens. Mm -hmm. And from a lot of trial and error, I think I've really gotten to a place where now I know the best ways to approach material, what order to sort of go in as well. I think that's very important, especially in a mathematics classroom, the order that we present in different not just different topics, but within a specific topic, different um, foundations that are laid down for that specific mathematical device. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. So I'd say just going through the, the usual life of a professor, you know, semester to semester, things really get fine-tuned throughout. And you start to realize what's important with students, what resonates well with them, and what doesn't. Right. And that really helps to, I think, fine-tune that experience into something that's most beneficial for them. Yeah, I agree with you on that. So I also ran, and, and this is, um, I'm not going to embarrass you, but on UB Reddit, you had such good reviews. I don't know if you've seen them or not, but you had things such as, legit the coolest professor at UB. People went on to say, wish they had you as every teacher for every class. Um, other posts said the best professor ever. So what do you attribute that to? That's that's very kind. I, I try not to go on to those sites too much because any 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 negative comment will certainly make me feel not great about it. But it's nice to hear from you that there's a lot of positive things there. You know, I think that what makes me such an effective educator, if I am one at all to begin with, is I think I'm a very good public speaker. Yeah. 
And I think that I, I do try to be entertaining, which sometimes does not work out in the classroom. But I think those skill sets really lend to helping out in the classroom. Mm-hmm. I think that the subject that I teach is almost secondary to that. I think that I could be a, a great lecturer standalone. And I think that really comes from a, an ability to, to, you know, strong public speaking skills, mm-hmm. you know, trying to connect with students and a little bit of entertainment here and there. So... So the reason that I ask you all of that is because math for me um, is and and was extremely challenging. Um, So what do you think some of the most effective strategies that you've used to making math more approachable to your students or understandable for your students? You know, I think adopting multimodal learning and incorporating that into the classroom has been very important for students, especially in the classes that I'm teaching, differential equations. We have Python projects, a little bit of coding there. We get really visual with the answers too, viewing responses on slope fields, uh, phase portraits, things like that. So there's definitely a very strong visual aspect to the course. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that, you know, nothing can really take the place of or circumvent quality lecture. And I am lucky to be teaching the course that I'm teaching differential equations because students are are very focused. They want to learn the material for their major, right? And I really do believe first and foremost that great students make good professors and not the other way around. So I do think that I, I am reaping the benefit of that. I think that one of the best ways that I could approach material for students is by helping with strong scaffolding. Mm -hmm. I think that's really at the pith and marrow of everything that I do as an educator. I'm always trying to connect with students and to find the best way to approach the material. Um, And like mentioned, I I do try to be entertaining so the course doesn't drag on so much. Mm -hmm. It can be a long semester, but I think sometimes the students could really do without some of the the anecdotes. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I think that that makes you human and they connect with you. So I think that's kind of nice. Um, So moving into um, innovative teaching approaches, AI, things of that nature. So in what ways do you, if at at all, uh, incorporate real-world, real-world applications, maybe innovative teaching approaches or technologies? Do you use anything like that in your courses? Well, so the course that I'm teaching, Differential Equations, is largely application-based. So most of what I teach, if not all of what I'm teaching, has applications at the helm of it. We do a lot of work with like mass spring dash pot systems, practical resonance, resonance disaster, phase portraits for predator prey systems as nonlinear systems, which I think really makes the Jacobian come alive in the mathematics. So I think that's beautiful. I think that the, you know, the real world applications are really important for students to get a, a strong idea as to, you know, why we care about what math has to offer. I think sometimes the abstractions can be difficult for some students and definitely Back even earlier in their their mathematic careers, you think about arithmetic-based operations, algebra. You know, why are we adding two numbers together? Why are we solving for x? What is what is the what is the point of this? And you know, I think it's important to have those applications so that students can see why it's so important. There is a bit of a trade-off to it because I think in some lower-level courses. Applications might also mean word problems. Mm-hmm. I think some students don't love word problems. Mm. <laughs> but I think the applications are very important. But I do want to mention the other side of that coin. In my classroom, we also discuss pure mathematics as well. I think that's very important. I mean, I have my unique lens as a, a mathematician. I think it's important that they have that side of it as well because they're in their majors. They have the partner disciplines too mm-hmm. that really focus on the applications of what we're doing. And I think it's important for the students to also be somewhat subjected to, you know, the abstractions of pure mathematics. And some students wind up even enjoying it. A few of them will stop me and say, you know, hey, I'm using the material that we learned in this class that I'm taking, right? And then they'll go through and they'll talk about it. And it just makes me feel great that they retain the information. Mm -hmm. They're using it in their major in a different course. Um, They take good notes and they have those to fall back on. And that I think is the the most important part is what happens after they leave the classroom. Yeah. You know, we get our shared time together, which is wonderful, but I want to make sure that it's doing what it should be doing for them. And, you know, hearing about those stories from previous students is, ah, that's my favorite part. Yeah, I'm sure it is. How do you build the confidence in your students? Do you experience your students having a lot of math anxiety? And how do you kind of, you know, curb that? Well, I think this... This sort of falls under 
better consolidation of material, I think it's just you want to build confidence and rapport with the subject. So, for example, you want to think of your favorite thing to do. What, what are some of your favorite things to do, Maggie? I like to hike. I like to uh, swim, mostly outdoor things. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So sort of like recreational things. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm a big fan of cats and guitar. These are some of the things that I love. And if I think about those things, they don't really generate much anxiety on most levels. So I think the idea is I want to try to take mathematics and bring it into that light, bring it into that frame. If we can make mathematics into something fun that mm -hmm. you're in love with, mm -hmm. then maybe some of that anxiety can be alleviated. I also deliberately set up a syllabus um, to curtail some of this anxiety. And I'm lucky that I'm still in a course where I can set my own syllabus. Some of our lower level courses have departmental syllabi, which I think are done very well. But in my course, I will give three midterms. These are just regular ass exams. Mm -hmm. And then I have a cumulative final at the end of the semester. And of the three midterms, I actually drop the lowest exam score. And the final exam is worth as much as a midterm is. So it's not worth more. It's not a higher stakes exam than just one of these regular in-class exams. And also worth as much as an exam, be it a final or a midterm, is the homework. Right. And I give students unlimited attempts on the homework and it's really just for them to work out the kinks, make sure that they understand the material and are ready for these larger assessments. And then I have other things, too, contributing to that final grade from the quizzes. And we do coding projects with Python in our department, getting students to do some, you know, some coding. We have some first-time students that have never coded before and are, are a bit sort of anxious about that, understandably so, but in our 300 level courses like linear algebra and differential equations, mm -hmm. we get students starting with coding and using Python and everyone leaves feeling, I think, much better about it, gives them a new skill set and gives them something that, hey, they could even sort of put it on a resume if they'd like to, right? And we have some computer science majors that have coded but never using Python. We have people that I think thought they would survive through life with never having to do it. <laughs> and then I have to break it to them. Well, we're going to do it, but it's also going to be manageable and fun. We're not going to try to keep it as something difficult. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to lead you into this very gently. And with all of those things in my syllabus, though, it really sets up the stage for a student to be in direct control of their success, right. dropping one of those midterms. So let's say somebody does poorly on a, a first exam. And I, first of all, I don't like to look at exam scores or, or assessments in general as being good or bad as far as the grades that are received. I look at them as contributing versus non-contributing. And let's say a student gets like a 50 or a 60 on an exam. Okay, so it probably won't wind up on the refrigerator door or something like that. But it contributes to a final grade and contributes more than like a 20 or a zero would towards that final grade. And I really kind of want to look at it in that light and also mention that, well, in my syllabus, I'll drop a low exam score. Mm -hmm. So if we had a bad first exam, we want to identify the things that went wrong. We want to be communicative. We want to talk to our instructor and our TAs. We want to make sure that we let someone know that we're proactive about our situation. And we could end up losing that exam score in a final average. Mm. And it, it sort of presents its own unique challenges at the end of the semester because even towards, let's say, the last month, there's still a lot of the grade in the control of the students. Mm -hmm. So all the students that maybe haven't performed as well as they would have hoped earlier in the semester, mm -hmm. and they'll come to me in a bit of a maybe panicked state. Maybe there's a bit of anxiety there. I understand that. I'm empathetic towards that. But I can say to them, you know, you still have a lot of assessments ahead. Mm -hmm. And even though it seems strange because we're close to the end of the semester, you know, we still have maybe another midterm and a final exam. And some remaining homework assignments, maybe a last Python project that we're still going to be graded on. Mm -hmm. And you could really change your situation. But now we want to identify what the issues are. We want to talk. And I always tell them, like, well, when you're studying, you know, check in with me. Send me an email. Let me know what you like. Let me know what isn't going well. We want to keep our strengths as strengths and turn our weaknesses into strengths as well. I think it's also important to be approachable to students. Be empathetic, right? Right. Math is difficult to many students. Mm -hmm. And I also want to make sure that I'm passionate about what I'm doing in the classroom. You know, if, I, if I'm if i not fully enamored with mathematics, how could I expect that to be infectious? Right. Right? Or I would expect that then to sort of take the place of it, you know. So I try to make sure that students know I'm, I really enjoy the material. And I think some of that does rub off a little bit, yeah. you know. And I always tell my students, you want to 
be the change you want to see in the world, that no one is going to take that first step for you. And in the classroom, we can take that first step together. Right. Are there any other um, teaching strategies that you want to tell our listeners about? Oh, absolutely. I am a (laughs) big fan of exit slips. I've always been a big fan of this strategy in the classroom. And uh, for those of you that are maybe wondering, you know, what is an exit slip? So let's say, for example, I'm doing some problem sets with students in lecture. And I'm a very traditional lecturer. I like to be up at the blackboard. Um, I don't do I don't do too much that isn't sort of classical teaching. Mm-hmm. But with exit slips, let's say I have four examples that I'd like to, you know, expose the students to. I'd like us to go through together. I could do three of them and save like a medium difficulty level problem and give that to students to work on at the end of class. So we'll say like with the last five or 10 minutes of class lecture time, mm-hmm. instead of me doing this one lecture that I removed from the middle of my example set, I will put it up on the board and I'll say, all right, everybody work on this. If you're one of the, you know, a lone wolf character like me, work on it by yourself. I get it. If you want to work in small groups, you can. No more than three. <laughs> and they'll work in the small groups and there'll be some communication happening there. They'll bounce ideas off one another mm-hmm. and they'll come to me with their solutions. And I got the red pen. I always have the red pen. And if I give them the red check mark, then they're free to go. They could leave or they could help some other groups out. Mm-hmm. And then if they come up and it's not quite where we want it to be, I can give them some encouraging remarks, what I like about their work, but I can also tell them maybe a a hint, some suggestion as to where they want to to go back and readdress things they could improve. And then they can go back and work on it a bit more and, and try to do that. Now, the reason why I like exit slips so much is it really helps with consolidating material, right? And I tell my students all the time, when you work on homework, matters a great deal towards consolidating material and true of anything in life. The idea is I want to be an active participant in this, right? So I think it's important not only for students to be, you know, taking lecture notes, obviously, but also trying to work on problems on their own. And it is my job, right, to make math look easy and like it's something that is something we can do, right? Not impossible, right? And I want to make sure, though, that they can recreate that same experience, that same pleasurable experience on their own. Mm -hmm. And doing that right at the end of a lecture is Mm -hmm. the best time to build those neural pathways and those strong retrieval cues, which then in turn makes doing the homework easier, studying is easier, success on exams is easier. Exit slips, I think, are a great way to take, to borrow part of your lecture time and reappropriate in a bit more of a useful way. All right. So I hope that this conversation engaged um, and encouraged other people and our listeners uh, to connect with their students, reach their students, read their students, be open and um, available to your students. And I really appreciate you sharing your insights and your um, techniques to our audiences and as well as myself. I do also hope that everyone listening in, you're able to take away something useful from these comments that I have from my own unique teaching experience. I hope you're able to take away something useful from the things that I've said. All right. So thank you for joining us today at the teaching table. Today we discussed innovative ways in which teaching approaches can help student success in mathematics with Professor Corey Placido. Be sure to connect with us online at buffalo.edu slash cat, that's C-A-T-T, or email us at ubcat at buffalo.edu. 